quick topic to talk about regarding Patrick Mason's interview with uh, Playful Magazine. Now, Playful Magazine has been getting a bit of stick from my side of, you know, social media or my side of the internet, especially when it comes to clubs and stuff, because of maybe how lackluster some people think the interviewer is, right? The host of the show. Um, I don't necessarily mind her. If anything, I feel like sometimes she does come across as if like her mind is elsewhere when she's interviewing some people. Um, sometimes the research isn't really up to par or deserving of the artist that they interviewing because they get some fucking fantastic guests right this 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 um, web website uh, called playful magazine it's an online magazine and they've also got a youtube channel where they have interviews with loads of people from the dance music scene um that i'm obviously a fan of and people that i kind of want, want to get to know and bloody blah 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 it's mostly based in berlin if i'm not mistaken so you can kind of get an idea of the kind of people that they're going to focus on there and the host the lady here on the left again does a fairly decent enough job i think her affable uh bubbly cheerful personality i think kind of helps because she doesn't come into it being too much of a chin stroker where sometimes a lot of these journalists in dance music are sort of like what i would deem to be like um you know like when in stand-up comedy where you have these people who maybe are super critical you know they, they, yeah sometimes super critical stand-ups and their positions on certain issues in society and shit and then you'll find out oh this person's like a failed stand-up so essentially a lot of these failed stand-up comedians could kind of usually go into this weird uh, kind of social justice lane um, and then start pulling up other comedians because it never quite worked out for them so I don't ever get the feeling that this lady is like a failed DJ who never really made it and is now kind of trying to you know put herself to be the most pop, you know important person in the world by interviewing people I think a lot of the RA journalists back in the day had that sort of like vibe about them where they thought they were way too important than what they actually were I think she plays a position really well she's here as the host she's here as the interviewer kind of um, she's there to create like a part, fun positive type of vibe i just would have wish she'd just have a little bit more researched a little bit more you know um research going into interviewing the person apart from wikipedia entries or just whatever first link she read on google um maybe a little bit more engagement and connection with the artist because sometimes again like i said maybe it's a personality but she seems that like sometimes she's a bit like off in the clouds but apart from that i feel like the reason why they probably get all the guests on the show is partly because of her because she's really laid back and chill so it's kind of a double-edged sword if you want a more journalistic if you want to know more in, uh, investigative, investigative, a little bit, I wouldn't say confrontation, but a little bit more of a interview interview, you're probably not going to get the artists that she's interviewing because they don't want to speak like that, right? They, they probably have really horrible takes. Um, they're probably not the most self-aware people in the world. Um, so you don't want them to speak about certain things because they're going to really end up kind of getting trashed online, losing fans and having a lot of headache for nothing. So they probably need to have this person be a little bit more laid back and chill and they can kind of be themselves. Anyway, long story short, there's this little series on there um on a date with patrick mason at glitch festival what happened recently and or this past summer sorry and um patrick mason made a really interesting comment regarding his appearance at printworks for an afterlife event right and i was kind of surprised when i did see his name on the fly i'm not gonna lie there's been a few of these festivals and events happening around where i see patrick mason's name on flies i've been like hmm i wonder was this just a cash grab was this just him trying to like prove himself on that platform because there didn't seem to be any real synergy behind what he does who he is as an artist as a dj with what these promoters are doing and at the time i thought to myself this feels a little bit like tokenism right it feels like they're kind of using him for how he looks using him from what he represents to sort of make their party look like they're more forward thinking more progressive more accepting and bloody blah 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 and diverse quote unquote than they actually are and i'm glad that he said what he said because i think you know you can use the whole like you can use the fact that some places want to tokenize you to your advantage right him being a mixed race guy him playing music the way he plays um him being a gay guy all these things are important parts of his identity but some people could use them as ways to kind of make themselves look a little bit more progressive than what they actually are but i feel like in dance music because it's so competitive because it's such a um cutthroat industry you kind of have to use everything that's available to you to get forward you really have to it's really sad to say that but it kind of is the case so you can use it to your advantage but sometimes there comes a point where it's like the juice isn't worth the squeeze because a bit of your humanity your dignity gets stripped away from you when people keep tokenizing you in a way and not seeing you as a person so i'm glad he said what he said so let's play the clip of patrick mason basically talking about how he found his agent um from um obviously the work he did at printworks and he kind of briefly speaks about how it didn't go too well that gig and why he did wasn't a fan of it the story the first time we encountered each other was last year when i played printworks uh, for afterlife which was more of an <clears throat> 
complicated <laughs> endeavor. Um, but he was the, uh, the stage manager at that time, and he was the one and only person who was taking care of me, proper care of me, and made me feel secure and welcome. Mm. And um, a, a, yeah, a venue I didn't feel fitted for. You know, I felt I was like. Uh, yeah, a bit tokenized, I have mm. to say. Oh, um, wow. So I was like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do the gig. I, anyone at the entire lineup was playing a completely different sound, you know what Afterlife is about. And I did the uh, exact opposite because, you know, you book me for me. I pl I'm not going to play like down tempo, uh, no. <laughs> atmospheric, melodic tech house. So um, I brought the vibes and I felt like, okay, I played also downstairs. So in the Inkwell, I think, was the, uh, is the second stage. The vibe was inc was incredible. Like the people were very giving, and the English crowd is always very much uh, on fire. But he was the one. Shout out to British people. Shout out <laughs> to all the Brits down there. And um, yeah, he gave me like a very good feeling of security and of awesome. welcoming. Awesome. And um, two months, or three months later, I had um, a meeting in Ibiza with this, uh, the ex tour manager of Adam Bayer, who is now starting his own um, agency for tour management and production. Really? And yes, exactly. And what did you do with them? Anyway, you get the gist of it, right? So, interesting comment to make. Um, first off, it's probably unfortunate that he got hired to do an afterlife party at Printworks because Printworks at the time is closed now, but it was probably up there with one of our most commercial venues in the world or commercial venues in the UK, similar to like a really big fabric. So he was always going to be up against it, especially if it being an afterlife party, especially being if it being in Printworks. You, there wasn't much synergy there to be had. But I do respect the bravery to be like, you know what, you booked me to, you booked me for me. So I'm not going to change how I play to fit with your crowd because if you've heard Patrick Mason's sets, you will know it's not melodic house. It's not atmospheric house. It's not tech house. It's not nothing to do with all those things that they want you to play in those type of places. It's complete opposite of it. And if anything, it's the complete, um, it's like the complete opposite of what anybody in there will be into. Because I feel like a lot of techno people who are into basically Patrick Mason would not be into deep house or tech house. It's a completely different scene. The, the, you know, the values, how they dress, the outlook on the world, it's just completely different. So it's a very interesting and bizarre way for them to try to introduce him to their audience in the first place. So that's why I'd be curious to know from the booker or whoever it is who put him forward, why they thought it would be a good option anyway. Was it a purposeful thing because they wanted to maybe branch out and not have it always be tech house, tech house? Or was it really just a thing of like, okay, cool, here's this guy. He ticks the quota right half white half black we can kind of fill that quota out um he represents um the gay community the queer community lgbtq community call that text the box off and he plays his techno shit if it was just a numbers game or if it was just them being a little bit more hey let's be a little bit more open-minded open this thing out to other people i'm not be too sure but like i said i'm i like the bravery because if you've been to places before if you ever performed or dj places you'll know how kind of nerve-wracking it is to be booked somewhere for one thing no book somewhere that plays one particular genre you get asked then to play your own stuff there and then you go in there before you're there early you're hearing other people play it can be quite nerve-wracking to get up on the booth and start to play your own shit because you know the people that are there are only there for a specific sound so to have the guts to just stick to your sound says a lot about how much you trust your artistry where you are in terms of your career and stuff and just your confidence overall and you just kind of you know what i don't give a fuck however this goes however this goes so i really do sort of respect that a lot but it does go to show and speak to the issues around tokenism in the, in the first place um it's really difficult especially when your community you're seeing or people that go out to your party haven't necessarily been introduced to the person that you want to bring in in maybe the correct way it kind of always feels like you're using them a little bit you know especially again if they tick certain boxes it's always going to feel like you're using them for your own kind of um way to appear that you're being progressive and whatnot and it's not really pushing anything forward it's not really helping anybody and if anything it just kind of leaves a sour taste in the mouth of the people on the dance floor um because as much as I despise some of the tech house, deep house stuff, I can also appreciate if they're there to hear that sort of stuff and they suddenly are kind of blitzed with 140 BPM plus Euro, um, trash, hardcore, techno vibes, whatever else people play, then of course I can understand why you're upset because to go to Printworks isn't cheap. That venue at the time when it was open was like a 30 pound plus venue, maybe even more. So you're paying all that money, you're hiring a babysitter, you're going out to these places to go and you're going to play, to, to go dance and shit and then here you are being suggested to music that you 
didn't want to listen to because you specifically booked a ticket to see an afterlife event not to see an event with someone like a Patrick Mason playing but again like I said I respect the kind of steadfastness that he had in terms of no I'm going to play what I want to play um, if you guys don't like that fair play and I'm sure in the end it might have maybe affected him because maybe they're like you know what we're not going to book you again and I'm sure with how small the DJ world is that might affect your other gigs and shit but it does go to show about the confidence that he has to be like you know what this is what I'm in here for um, I would rather die um, you know on my own shield than be able to go out on the, someone else's so I can really respect that one so big up Patrick Mason and you know I've always had a bit of a um, soft spot for him anyway because I feel like he's my weird DJ spirit animal just because of the of, of, of me seeing the fucking progression over the years I think it was like what over five years maybe or maybe less than that from the times I saw him before COVID all the way until now to suddenly becoming this globe trotting DJ that's playing you know I think he mentions in the interview he had like 30 gigs or something plus in a month or something so a stupid amount of output and you can see that he clearly went from being somebody playing like a, what I would say was what my level was in terms of playing in hotel lounge bars playing for friends small independent parties and then slowly but surely getting to a place where he's got like a proper agent touring manager and shit he's flying you know all around the world playing these glitzy places it's quite incredible to see to be honest so big up Patrick Mason and it's nice to see the growth